I'm Dr. Michelle O'Donnell here reporting for Medscape. Joining me today are two interventional cardiologists with whom I've had the pleasure of speaking with in the past and we'll be doing really a sequel, so to speak, um, to a prior conversation that we've had about the results of, of ischemia. So joining me today are Dr. Rasha Alame. I always pronounce your name, so I apologize for that, from the Imperial College in London, um, as well as Dr. Jacqueline Thomas Holland um, from Mount Sinai in New York. So welcome both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for joining Good me today. You. So, you know, I think just bringing everyone up to speed, it's obviously been a relatively rapidly evolving field um, as we've had different trials along the way that have helped to build the evidence base that, that, we've, that we now have. So we've had Courage, you've led the effort on, on Orbita, um, and we've also had, had ischemia. And we'll, we'll talk about where we are now, but do you want to just perhaps remind everyone, you know, sort of how the, the field has been set? Yeah, so thank you very much, Michelle. I mean, I think the stable coronary artery disease space has really changed over the last decade or two. It obviously started with Courage that first shocked the world by telling us that in patients with stable coronary artery disease, we didn't need to rush them to revascularization. And that in fact, the outcomes for optimal medical therapy versus PCI were much the same. With Orbiter, we looked at symptomatic improvement and looked at the difference between patients who had a placebo procedure versus PCI and didn't find the symptomatic improvement that we might have expected from PCI. And now with ischemia, we've really started to think about the patients who have a much higher burden of ischemia, moderate or severe ischemia, and whether revascularization changes outcomes for those patients. And again, we're starting to see that the outcomes really aren't influenced by revascularization, be, be it PCI or cabbage. And I guess the final trial to really talk about is the REVIVE trial, which has told us that in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, um, the outcomes for patients who have PCI really aren't different to those who have optimal medical therapy. So there is a burden of evidence now that's driving us towards thinking that at the very least we have clinical equipoise between revascularization and medical therapy. Um, but, you know, potentially there's more to come to tell us exactly which patients revascularization may, may make an influence on. Yeah, so I think, you know, each time we've tried to dial up um, the level of risk, so to speak. So um, I think with ischemia, really identifying those who have um, more concerning signs of ischemia um, uh, on imaging or thinking about coronary CTA as a gateway for, for decision making. Um, and yet we still haven't been able to really modify concrete events. So um, we're not seeing a clear reduction in, in mortality um, or myocardial infarction, um, but we are able to, to see symptomatic improvement. And I think that a lot of interventionalists have still you know, said, well, for my patient who is having still symptomatic stable angina, despite maximal medical therapy, um, that revascularization still may play a role in, in that setting. So, so where do the guidelines um, currently put us in terms of how we manage our patients with stable angina? Yeah, so I mean, I think what we want to focus on is just like you said, we want to focus on symptom improvement or whether we're going to change somebody's prognosis. And uh, despite the orbita, there are a lot of other studies that show that uh, revascularization does improve symptoms. And so certainly, I think we all as interventional cardiologists reserve this as one of the most important reasons why we might revascularize somebody. Um, and in my opinion, it really boils down to whether it's classic typical angina or whether they're uh, morbidly obese and have a little bit of dyspnea walking eight blocks, which may not be angina at all, it might be COPD. Um, so I think it, you have to tease out truly how symptomatic they are. Um, but then the other flip side of the guidelines is, you know, the recommendations for revascularization just to improve cardiovascular outcomes. And while really PCI doesn't really have a role in terms of, um, or, or in terms of patients with stable disease, normal ejection fraction, um, besides improving symptoms, I think that um, there's still some debate. And now we have a class 2A recommendation, in part based on ischemia, to say that if you have somebody with multivessel disease that revascularization with either PCI or cabbage can reduce your risk for cardiovascular events, including spontaneous MI and um, cardi cardiovascular death. So. so how should we think about approaching our patient with stable angina for evaluation? Um, you know, some people are still in the camp that it makes more sense to do a, a stress test, um, some sort of more functional assessment. And then for other people, it's more of an anatomic assessment. Should we think about a coronary CTA as that kind of gateway before thinking about bringing somebody to the cath lab. Others may also still just bring them straight to the cath lab. So, so where do you sort of settle in on that? Yeah, so I mean, in the UK, it's been quite different for a long time. Since 2016, the CTCA really has become the gateway for our patients with stable coronary artery disease. And I think increasingly across the world, that's also becoming the sort of flavor of what people do. 
Mainly, I use the CTCA to exclude high burdens of anatomic risk, so left main disease, very severe three vessel disease, um, and also to take out those patients with unobstructed coronary arteries. And what we've seen from a wealth of data is if we do a CTCA up front, we not only characterize their risk, and of course that really changes our preventative therapies, but also reduces the amount of patients that get to an invasive cath and have unobstructed coronary arteries. And so clearly there is a reduction in terms of cost for the system overall, but also risk that we put our patients through in terms of what they what happens next. So for me, actually, the functional space has kind of reduced in my practice and I use functional testing far less than I did in the past. So that's interesting. I mean, Jacqueline, what are your thoughts? Because I think, you know, some some would say that that makes perfect sense as an approach. Um, and then there are others who, who feel like, well, you know, if, that, if I then see a 70 percent lesion um, when I bring that patient to the cath lab, um, how do I know if it's really clinically relevant? So yeah. is, is that where you think about FFR or other yeah. types of, of ways of guiding your decision making? So I, I guess I think it depends on what my question is about the patient. If my question is, are your symptoms related to ischemia or related to uh, cardiovascular pro cardiac problems, then I do want a functional test of some sort. And so sometimes a coronary CTA with FFR is fine or IFR in the cath lab. But if I really just want to know sort of like what you're saying, is this at all CAD, then uh, it's easy because you do the cat, the CTA and it's either negative or positive. Um, the flip side of it is in terms of using it as a gatekeeper to cath lab after we've done the stress test, so not as an initial strategy, but after we've done the stress test like ischemia used it. Um, I also think it depends on the underlying uh, patient's syndrome. So if they have our priority, if I know I see multivessel disease and they're going to have an indication for revascularization anyway, then why do the CTA? Because if it shows something which we pretty much think there's an indication for, we're going to go ahead and we're going to do something anyway, whether it's PCI or whether it's cabbage. And in our, in our country, I don't think any surgeon would do cabbage without seeing a, a cath as opposed to a CTA. Um, on the other hand, if it's something that their symptoms are not very strong, they happen to have ischemia because of a pre-op stress test because prior to hernia surgery or something, then I think the CTA becomes very valuable. So I think it depends on the patient that I'm taking care of. Um, and I personally think that why should you expose them to double the dye and double the radiation if we're going to go on to cath anyway? So I think with, with ischemia extend, you know, it was interesting to see the results because we now have longer term follow up. And of course, with these types of studies, it's hard because there's crossover between between the arms. Um, but it, it was interesting to see that overall, even though the effect on all cause mortality was neutral for an invasive approach, um, it was intriguing that there was a reduction in cardiovascular death and yet an uptick yes. in non cardiovascular death. And unfortunately, we're not going to get more information uh, yes. really much beyond that just because of um, by virtue of what was what data was being collected. Yeah. Uh, so what are your thoughts there? Does that, this change your thinking at all or, or you're just pretty much in the same place as, as before because there's no effect on mortality? Yeah, I mean, I find those results, I mean, they're very interesting, but actually quite confusing. Yeah. Um, I think what is interesting is to look at the kind of trial design of that extend subset. So beyond the, the initial uh, follow-up of the ischemia trial, all events have now been adjudicated at the sites and there isn't a clinical adjudication committee to really confirm um, the, the event adjudication. Now, the ischemia investigators have told us that over 90% of events that were adjudicated initially by sites in the initial ischemia trial cohort had confirmed events by the CEC, so things didn't really change. Having said that, we know that there's always an issue with adjudication to cardiovascular death and there can be real um, difficulties in trying to work out exactly what caused the death in a patient. We don't have any data on, on MI rates because, of course, that wasn't collected in that extended subset. And so for me, that data is kind of interesting, maybe hypothesis generating, but I'm not sure what to make of it. And I think probably we have to hang our hat on the all-cause mortality data where there really wasn't a difference. Yeah, I, I do agree with you. I would tend to say I'm not sure what to make of that data. But I do think there was an interesting study that came out from ischemia uh, two years back where they looked at the coronary CTA results. And when you had basically anatomy suitable for cabbage or anatomy suitable for multivessel PCI, that there was a, an improvement in cardio, the com combined endpoint of cardiovascular death or MI. Again, it was only using coronary CTA patients and then looking at those who were randomized to invasive versus conservative care. So I do think that there is a suggestion mm -hmm. that perhaps cardiovascular death or MI 
is reduced because in patients with a really severe burden of coronary artery disease. And so that's why I sometimes feel just go straight for the cath to understand what you're doing. Yeah. And so it, it is sort of consistent with the findings that they saw in ischemia extend, but at least it supports the rationale why when you see severe CAD, like greater than 70% with proximal LED involvement, then maybe it implies a worse prognosis. And who do we not think about um, doing testing before bringing them to the cath lab? So for instance, just practically for somebody who comes in who's had a prior history of revascularization, let's say, are you still doing coronary CTA in, in those situations, bringing yeah. them straight to the cath lab? Yeah, so I find that quite, I mean, obviously our CTs aren't fantastic when there's an yeah. artifact due to previous stents. Obviously the elderly, so over the age of 70, we see very high calcium burdens and often our CTs are in, inconclusive. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a subset of patients where I think it's not as important. And I think Jacqueline's also mentioned, you know, that space where you're looking for a reduction in blood supply to the heart, but that may not be due to epicardial coronary disease. So maybe the women or, yeah. or, or people for whom they have angina and we're trying to find a cause, those patients maybe CTCA isn't, isn't as valuable. Um, so there's definitely a subset where I think functional testing is still very important. Yeah. So I, I guess it's just as a final thought and question, you know, how do you feel that the, the field has really evolved since uh, essentially courage was the real first game changer in this space, um, you know, and then followed by the studies that we've discussed? Do you feel like there's been a tangible shift in practice during that time? So for me, I think what's changed isn't necessarily the numbers of patients that have revascularization. I mean, they, that may have changed over time. What I expect will have changed is the pathway and the kind of, you know, approach that we take to these patients. I think we rush a lot less now. And I hear all the time from colleagues that they feel that they have the time to up titrate medication, to reconsider the symptoms, and that they have quite an informed conversation with patients about what's next. So maybe that's what's changed, just our pathway to the cath lab. And we'll see if in time, revascularization numbers in themselves change. Yeah, no, I agree completely with that. And I, I also feel that uh, there's a more thoughtful decision making, our priority before the cath, to really hone in on what, what you're here for. What are your symptoms and what's your ejection fraction? So a real thoughtful understanding of what are the benefits of revascularization, again, before we even get to the cath lab, and there's not that rush. So you have the time to talk to the patient to really just sort of optimize medical therapy. And if you need to go on to cath, that's fine, but you might end up with the revascularization, but after you've had a thoughtful uh, thought process to decide that there was an indication for revascularization. Yeah, no, and I think that we always make the comment almost in passing about optimizing medical therapy, and yet I think there are too many clinicians who are still just jumping ahead without yes. having first really taken that, that critical step. So anyway, thank you so much yeah. for discussing this, this very uh, interesting topic that continues to evolve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Signing off from Medscape, this is Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue.